So it's January 22nd, 2012, and that means it's D.W. Griffith's birthday. And he was born January 22nd, 1875, and died July 23rd, 1948. Uh, the, the D.W., by the way, stands for David Llewellyn. And uh, Griffith has been called the Shakespeare of the screen. And, you know, he's very important in cinema, as you probably know if you're watching this. Um, about the movies he once said using terminology at the time, that the talkies, the squeakies, the moanies, the songies, the squawkies, just give them 10 years to develop and you're going to see the greatest artistic medium the world has ever known. And I think most of us would agree that Griffin was very, very right about that statement. His major film is, of course, The Birth of a Nation from 1915, which negatively depicted black Americans. But interestingly, uh, Griffith responded to the public outrage and took steps to to say something about that in his next film, which was Intolerance. Um, the controversy aside, Birth of a Nation and Intolerance, as well as Broken Blossoms before it, greatly innovated on both the technological and narrative dimension, dimensions of cinema at the time. And I suppose it could be said that uh, probably part of the controversy that followed Birth of a Nation stems precisely from the fact that he was such a technical master. Had he been a terrible filmmaker, most likely the disturbing representations and themes in Birth of a Nation would have been forgotten within minutes of leaving the screening room. More specifically, what did Griffith bring to the cinema? One of the most crucial elements is cross-cutting, or parallel editing as it's called. And this is a narrative technique in which we are taken back and forth between two, sometimes three or four separate narrative strands. Each segment starts off relatively long in terms of screen duration, but as the climax of the narrative approaches, the individual segments of the two or three different narrative strands become shorter and shorter, and that uh, uh, subsequent uh, shortness helps build the urgency of the drama as things build toward the inevitable conclusion. I especially recommend Broken Blossoms for an example of how this works. It's a really great film and it has a great pace and you can see that shortening of segments as the uh, conclusion comes. Um, less discussed with regards to Griffith is his use of abstraction. And this is something that really starts in his short films and gets used uh, in greater ways in the longer narratives. Uh, some of these short films are The Country Doctor from 1909 and A Corner in Wheat from 19. 09 as well. Um, these earlier elements, um, their, their influence is still felt to this day. Part of what I'm talking about is how Griffith emphasized formal balance, or what the film critic uh, and scholar and historian Tom Gunning has called visual rhyming. And Gunning wants to suggest that in using things like visual rhyming, Griffith is really going beyond just relaying the necessary narrative inf information to tell a story. What Griffith is doing is generating in the audience an awareness of the act of storytelling through technique, which is a kind of metacognition where you think about how you're thinking about something or you think about how you're viewing something. So for Gunning, uh, Griffith is really arranging narrative information in a film in a way that's just as important as the story that he's trying to tell which is to say that form takes on just as much important as content. Um, another thing that Gunning would say is that the structure of Griffith's films both enhances the narrative, but it also leads us away from the narrative in a certain sense, because we begin to consider the purely aesthetic dimensions of the film. I think a really interesting uh, contemporary example we could think of is in some of David Lynch's cinema, for instance, Lost Highway. You have all kinds of abstractions throughout that film, smoke rolling backwards, uh, buildings burning backwards and being restored. Uh, they certainly have to do with the story, these visual elements, but they also draw attention to non-narrative concerns as well, the lyrical and the rhythmical and the patterned. And I think there's a strong argument to, me, to be made that you can see the origins of this in, uh, in Griffith's, Griffith's cinema. And, you know, I don't make this reference to Lynch out of nowhere. I'm also thinking of Lynch because of how Lynch is notorious for, you know, telling actors to think of bananas and so on when they're performing their lines. And he's got other kind of avant-garde and dataistic directorial techniques. But I think this is really, uh, in terms of the cinema, prefaced with Griffith. And to give you one anecdote, Griffith once uh, told 
Dorothy Gish, who is Lillian Gish's sister, there's a scene where she's supposed to be opening a message and um, finding out about how a boyfriend is going to return, and Griffith says that she should get so excited that she pees a ring around herself. And those are apparently the words he used as related in a book by Carl Brown uh, called Adventures with D.W. Griffith. So another way of putting this is that in terms of both creating images and directing actors, Griffith really enters abstract concepts into narrative cinema. Um, and, and another example is how he might use a beautiful and a peaceful landscape to suggest that death is near, which is about giving a sense of mood and a sense of atmosphere and, you know, allowing mood and atmosphere to determine how actions and events in the narrative play out. It's not just the story elements at the level of the plot, but there's something about the mise-en-scene, there's something about the, the surrounding um, geography that's part of pushing the narrative elements and how they work. Uh, another thing that Griffith perhaps didn't introduce into the cinema on his own, but certainly made a habit of, is referring to various traditions from painting, and that's something to pursue in another talk. For, for these purposes today, one of the most interesting traditions I think that Griffith referred to was poetry, and he makes a film of Robert Browning's Pippa Passes as a good example. Um, and although that has a narrative and follows one of the strands in, in Browning's poems, um, it's this adapting of poetry that I think gave Griffith a great license to experiment. Um, and those experiments really appear in a strong way throughout his career. It's the use of poetic rhetoric that I'm getting at, um, making concepts tangible by registering mood and feeling, and making abstract statements about the nature of light and the nature of darkness, the experience of change as intangible forces like love and death cause shifts from darkness to light or from light to darkness. So in conclusion, happy birthday, D.W. Griffith, and thank you for everything you brought into the world through your cinema, and we'll see you next year and say something more.